last week we talked about God being in time and outside time. And I wanted to make it clearer, you know, so <laughs> we will not be confused. So I'll take the first five minutes to make that clearer. And I talked to you about the science in physics that um, is known as the space-time continuum. You know, space-time continuum. I also talked to you about um, quantum physics. And these uh, topics in physics and branches of physics have really started giving scientists insights into, for them, the, the skeptics, into the possibility that truly there is a God that created everything, not just a Big Bang. Because in quantum physics, they talk about atoms being able to exist at two different places at the same time. You know, a bit, you know, similar to the string theory. And it amazes them, how can an atom be in two places at the same time? And that's one of the things I was talking to you about last week. God is everywhere, all at once, at the same time. Now, science is getting a glimpse into the reality and the existence of God. And I think that is amazing. I think that is amazing. I think that is amazing. Science is proving that there is a God. There is a God. So in the space-time continuum, it actually means that anywhere there is matter, there is time. And that was the point I was trying to prove to you guys last week. Anywhere there is matter, there is time. What is matter? Anything that has weight and occupies space. And since it was created by God, it came into existence at a particular point in time. So that is why anywhere there is matter, there is time. Before creation, God just existed. And because God is not matter, the Bible tells us that God is a spirit, he cannot be timed. God is a spirit. So he exists. He didn't come into being. He exists. And that is exactly how he introduced himself to Moses. He told Moses when he called him at the burning bush. He told Moses, go tell the Israelites, when Moses asked him, who will I tell the Israelites that sent me? He said, tell them that B sent you. God did not come into being. God is. <laughs> and has always been. And will always be. So he's not affected by time because it's no matter. But out of God came creation, which is matter. Be planet, space, whatever, name it, sun, stars, everything God created is matter. And time started not with God, but with creation. So whenever, or we don't know when, but the Bible says in the beginning. So in that beginning of the beginnings, where God decided to create the universe, time started with it. So that will give you a perfect understanding of what I mean by God being in timelessness. Now, because he created everything, and the Bible tells us that he's in his creation, that we can see him in his creation. The Bible tells us that he's everywhere. We can't restrict or limit God just to timelessness alone. If not, we'll be limiting God and be reducing his capacity. And we know that is not true. So God is in timelessness. And at the same time, he is in all his creation, especially heaven. Heaven was created. Heaven did not come into being when God came into being. Heaven is a planet. And why I'm sure of that is the Bible tells us in Revelation 22, the last chapter of the Bible, that when this current earth that we are in will pass away, that a new heaven and a new earth will come. And God will relocate from the planet which we currently call heaven to that new earth. And the Bible says that God will live amongst us. As he's living in that planet called heaven, he will live amongst us in the new earth. So that tells you that God, though exists in timelessness, also exists in his creation. And if that is not enough example for you to understand this, Let's go take another look into the Bible. In Genesis, 
God was in his creation. The Bible said that the cool of the evening, every evening, he comes down to the Garden of Eden. That is time. Can find God in time to hang out with, um, with the first man, Adam. At Mount Sinai, God came down and inhabited that mount for 40 days. He hung out with Moses. In Ezekiel, which is my favorite, because it's Ezekiel that has given us the closest description of God and his throne. After him is John in Revelation. But Ezekiel gave us a beautiful description of God and his throne. And you know his throne is made up of four angels. In chapter 1, in chapter 2, in chapter 3, you see Ezekiel describing God. God came down into time, into earth. So I hope that these few <laughs> examples proves to you that God does not only exist in timelessness. He exists in both. That is why he is present everywhere. I think that is amazing. One scripture I love about this that explains God in timelessness is Isaiah 57. Verse 15 says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. So it's not what eternity that confuses us. Because we think eternity means timelessness. No. Eternity is not timelessness. The word that is translated eternity in most places in the Bible is the word ad, A-D, or aid, depending on the pronunciation. Ad, from Hebrew, A-D. And what does A-D mean? It means terminus. Terminus does not mean restricted time. It actually means duration. Duration. But in the context of it used with God, it means timeless duration in the past and timeless duration in the future. I put down here that it means in the, it's used in the sense of perpetuity, meaning no end this way, no end that way. That's why when you read the Bible and some of the uh, epistles, when it's ending, it say, world without end. This universe will never end. So, when we say that God dwells in eternity, that's what we mean. Timeless past, you can't carbon date it. Timeless future, you can't carbon date it. That's why I gave you that picture. Never forget that picture I gave to you last week. It will change your perception about God and time. That God sees your birth, your now as we're in this meeting, and your death all at once. God does not flow with the time, if you know what I mean. No. He sees all time at once. Isn't that amazing? It changes your concept of God. It changes your attitude towards patience when you are waiting for a miracle. You know, we always say that God is delaying. God, why now? We need this miracle. Why haven't we seen it? We've seen it. You are delaying. Answer us. Answer us. Where would you answer us? We approach God in prayer <laughs> as if God is, in, is, is restricted to time as we are. No, 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 no. He sees everything all at once. So I say, God, do it, do it, do it. He's wondering, what, what are they talking about? <laughs> what are they talking about? God sees everything all at once. That's why I say that God will not answer, will not answer your prayer early. He will not answer your prayer late. He will answer your prayer right on time. Right on time. So the time you've put for your answer prayer to come might not be right on time for God. Ha, hallelujah. When you understand this, you are patient. You are patiently waiting. I would say that we should be like our fathers of old, who through faith and patience obtained the promises. They patiently waited for it. Now, patience does not mean doing nothing. It is actively giving God thanks, knowing that he has heard your prayer and he has answered, not that he will answer. That's another mistake we make. I want to say this. We, we say that, we well, only say this, that um, God answered our prayer so and so time. And we refer to the time when God answered our prayer at the time when we received the miracle. That is wrong. God did not answer your prayer when you received the miracle. God answered your prayers 
in Christ Jesus. I will look at that the last time. All of God's promises are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? All the answers you need to all your prayer points, God is telling you ahead of time that he's saying yes to it. Oh, I need to explain this. This, this will change your paradigm towards prayer. You no longer come to pray, you know, you no longer come to prayer with a sense that mm, will God answer? Will he not answer? Will God uh, no no no? It changes your perception about prayer. You now approach God's throne knowing that he has answered it. That's why I said in Hebrews. Oh, don't make me preach. I want, to, uh, I want to talk about two topics today. Don't make me preach. Today is, today is, today is for Bible study. But we need to change this paradigm. That's why Jesus said in Mark 11 verse 24. That when you come praying, don't doubt. Don't wonder. Don't speculate. No. He said when you come praying, believe that you have received. So you don't come to prayers wondering if you will receive. You come to prayers knowing, knowing for sure that you have received. You have received. And you have received it. Knowing for sure that you have received it. Because all of God's promises is yes and yes. I think that's how NLT puts it. Yes and yes. What is that? God is saying yes to your prayers. So far and so long is in accordance with his promises. If you are asking God to do something, he has already promised, go and sleep, go and rest. God has answered. So what do you do? You patiently wait for it. How do you do that? By thanking him, by praising him, by adoring him, by listening to your spirit. So you can detect when the Holy Spirit is guiding you into taking some actions of faith, which we call corresponding actions. He might say, okay, go there. Probably Jesus asked God just before his um, triumphant entry, where and how will I get a calf with which I will ride into Jerusalem with? And God, but I've told him what to do. I've prepared one for you, so I so please. What did Jesus do? Did he fold his hands and waited for the calf to find him? No. He got to the particular place. He told his disciples, go into that city. You will see a donkey, a calf, untie it and bring it to me. When you are bringing it to me, somebody will accost you and ask you, what are you doing? Just say to them that the master has need of it. Chikina, even though God has guided him on how to get a calf, he still needed to act by faith. If he didn't send his disciples to go and get the calf by faith, they would not have gotten that thing. That's the way it works. Two things you must know when you are patiently waiting for a miracle. Is constantly thank God because he has already told you he has given it to you. Then listen for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, where to go, what to do, how to do it, so that your miracle will locate you. That is how it works. God sees all time at once. So when you think you are pressurizing God to answer your prayer, you're actually pressurizing yourself. When you think you're putting pressure on God, God, when, 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 when? You're actually walking in doubt. You're actually filling your heart with so much worry. And those things cut short the period within that answer comes to you. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Of course, I showed you last week that uh, time being referred to in heaven. Revelation chapter 8 verse 1. John recorded that there was silence in heaven for the space of about 13 minutes. He didn't tell us if that 13 minutes was his own um, association to earth's time or was it an association to heaven's time? He didn't tell us. But for him to say that there is time in heaven. And I told you last week that the further away you are from the gravity of earth, time slows down. Time slows down. And that's part of the things that the space-time continuum proves. And one of the um, 
examples to that is the GPS on your phone. Whenever you're using your map to go somewhere, to direct you to a location, the map work, works with a device called GPS. GPS means Global Positioning System. It, it uh, being, pings all the Global Position satellites all over the world, there are many of them that are orbiting planet Earth. It pings it, then the satellite pings your exact location. Now it is said that those GPS satellites use the concept of space-time continuum, and that proves the point I'm trying to make to you now, as we end this first half of the of today's meeting. They say that the GPS satellites in space, because of the distance away from Earth and its gravity, adds 36 microseconds to its time every day, so it can coincide with the time on Earth. Because it is thousands of miles away from the gravity of Earth, it experiences time in space at a fraction slower pace than time here on Earth. At a fraction slower pace of the time here on Earth. Now you begin to understand what Moses said in Psalm 90, where he said that a thousand years for us here on Earth is like a day to God. That alone tells you that God is in time. The only, the only difference is the calibration of time, where he is and where we are. Because if God is not in time, Moses would not have said that. He's just saying that the time, that the time calibration here on earth is different. And that verse, or rather, space-time continuum, as postulated by Einstein, confirms that verse. Because Moses already said this 6,000 years ago. <laughs> Sorry, 4,500 years ago. He said it. Einstein just caught up. The physicists just caught up. They done the experiment and they found that it's true. The further away you are from Earth, time slows down. Moses said it thousands upon thousands of years ago. The Bible is, oh, it's awesome. I don't know how many of you know this guy. There's a pastor from away that died in a ghastly accident. You know, we used to bring it from some of our programs those days in, in uh, Dominion City. You know, he to tell her to talk about his experience in heaven. There's something he said. I think that one of the angels told him, Yes, you are dead, but we are going to show you things. Take you on an excursion. If I remember clearly, he said for 26 minutes. Correct me if I'm wrong, for those that know the story. He said, I'll take you on an, on, on an excursion for 26 minutes. So those two angels took him to heaven, took him to hell, and showed him some things. And according to him, it was for 26 minutes. So when he woke up in the mortuary, and he was asking how long he has been away, they told him three days. He said, no, no, it was 26 minutes. They told me 26 minutes. <laughs> but on earth time, on earth time, it was three days that he was dead. Three days. But to him, he felt, it felt like 26 minutes. Why? They were distances away, a long distance away from the gravity of Earth. Where he went to is a physical place. So the further away, the slower the time. For them, 26 minutes. For us, three days. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Okay, we're going to take a break now. Before we get into the second topic. The second topic is amazing. Does God forgive and forget? Now listen carefully. I'm going to play a video for us to watch. Then we are going to break out into groups just for five minutes. Please don't disconnect. Just for five minutes, I will come back. I'll play a video. You watch it. We'll break out into groups for five for five minutes in your groups. Discuss, discuss the things said in the video. There are two videos, but they are short. Two videos. Amazing things we are said in those two videos. I want you to discuss them in your groups. Amen. Please don't, don't disconnect. The second topic is very short. We'll be ending before 8 o'clock. Hallelujah. Are you ready? 